Tony, what do you think? I think that would be fair enough. I mean, maybe yeah. what you should do is um, if you can stop your screen share. Yes. And then um, we'll continue the conversation. Yes. And thank you very much, everybody. Wow. Um, it's good to see you all here. And um, I am... <clears throat> Really impressed by the range of places and people we got. Um, we now have so far, I've got five screens of um, participant panels, um, and there could well end up being a lot more within the next few minutes. But what I'm wondering about is if we should just get going. Um, I'm going to share a, do a screen share. I'm going to share a presentation that I've got here. Let me just get that ready to go and close off other windows. Okay. And this is the one that we're going to want. Okay. Tony, I know, Tony. Yeah? I know you are not going to introduce yourself. May I take the opportunity to introduce you, please? Oh, God, yes. You're so welcome <laughs> Just to <do> briefly. That. <laughs> Ever so briefly. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. You see, we are ready to go. Uh, thank you for joining us. Tony will be taking us to this um, uh, session. Tony is the convener of Image Africa and is an educational technologist in the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching in the, at the University of Cape Town. His operation and research interests include online collaboration, communities of practice in staff development, online facilitation, online conferences, and online professional networks. He is a co-author of OER, Facilitating Online Guide for Course Leaders, and is co-convener of the Facilitating Online Course. That is just a few of the things that Tony is. And as we go on, I'm sure you will realize that is much more than the introduction I've given. This uh, session is, is in collaboration with the International Association of Facilitators. And perhaps we'll be giving someone from, the, from that IAF uh, towards the end of the session to, tell, to say something. So over to you, Tony. And thank you very much for, every, for coming. Well, thank you very much, Irene, for that very generous introduction. Um, I just, just want to check that you or Jakob are just checking the waiting room because we have people entering the waiting room all the time um, and the numbers are coming up interestingly. Um, what I'm going to do now is to um, basically say that we all of us I guess, sitting in different levels and places of lockdown and isolation and restriction. Um, and if you can see my screen behind me, there is a background picture of one of my favorite places. Oh no, somebody's actually going and writing on this presentation. Um, I don't think we have permission to do that actually. That's not very helpful. Okay, my favorite places in the world, Musenberg Beach, where I just went for a walk yesterday, which is one of the, the first time I've been there in months, given the restrictions that we've had. And I'm sure all of you have your favorite places where you want to get outdoors um, and just breathe a bit of air outside of your homes as well. And I hope you've had a chance to, to start doing some of that. Okay. So um, let's actually do a present of this and let's see if you, you get it coming up on the full screen. Is it coming up on full screen for you? Yes. Yes. That's yes. good. Excellent. Okay. Um, and I just want to thank everybody who put their comments and their questions into the Padlet with questions about um, online facilitation. Um, and yeah, you've had a chance to introduce yourself a little bit in the chat. And I think we're going to move on a bit. Um, 
just to let you know that there is a folder um, which has resources for this event. Um, are you also seeing the scrolling all over the, your screen on the right hand side? Yes. Yes. I have no idea yes. where <laughs> it came from and who did that. Probably uh, we have a bomber. We have a Zoom we... bomber or something. <laughs> it's not possible, goodness. <laughs> well, and I'm not going to I'm not going to take five minutes to try and figure this one out now. We'll just put this down to um, arbitrary community participation. There is a folder that you have available to you to have a look and see this presentation available for your download, and also a online facilitation scenario slide deck, which we're going to use when you do breakouts later on in this event and where each group will have one slide that they can use. Um, and I see that Karin Omar has raised a hand. Hello, how are you? Uh, thank you very much. You see the annotation which is on your right hand side, the, the red one. Yeah. I think when you were setting this Zoom, you did not, uh, 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 you, di you did allow a notation. And so somebody uh, can easily draw that. And so like, uh, I'm the one now doing this. I did not do this, but you see, I can easily do that. I can easily do this. Thank you, do don't this. do any more. Please don't do any more. Stop, stop, stop. All right. So uh, go back to your setting because you will- No, uh, no, I won't do that. Mess you up, Karen, so. I'm not going to do that. And I'll tell you exactly why I won't do that. Yes, I wanted Exa to show you what somebody has done. Exactly right. why I Thank won't you. do that, Karen, is Thank because you. I want people to annotate in a minute. All right. Thank and you. And you'll see where and you'll see why. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. The place, yeah. thank, and thank you for thank you, pointing thank it you. out. Yeah, the reason you. why I want people to annotate is because uh, I'm going okay. to share this world map with you. Oh, and yeah. I'm going to encourage you to go to the annotation options yes. in Zoom. And mm -hmm. then um, once you go to the annotation options, yeah. you can then um, go and see um, the stamp options and use that to actually mark this map in terms of where you are. Ah, okay. Fine. Okay, so that's exactly what we're going to do. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause this share and I'm going to share something else. I'm going to do a new share. Um, and uh, let's see, let's just get out of this a bit and go back into a new, go into a new share. And this new share is going to be this map. And I'm going to ask you if you can go to your annotation options. And if you can then from your annotation options, use the stamp option and mark where on the map of this, of this planet you are currently. Fortunately, the map of Africa is big enough that we can actually see um, all the countries and, um, but there are people here potentially from other continents as well. So at the top of your screen, you should have your dashboard. Use the annotate option, the stamp option, and then mark where on the map you are. Okay. So I'm going to go to annotate and I'm going to go to stamp and I'm going to mark that I am in Cape Town. Okay, are people having difficulty getting to the annotate option? Yes. I'm not seeing okay. it. Um, Let's have a look. You should have annotate on your dashboard. Um, towards the right hand side, there should be a little pencil with annotate written below it. Is it not pencil you're talking about? I've annotation is enabled. You should be able to annotate. But, but I still can't. 
Um, are you looking from a cell phone or a tablet or a desk or a machine, a desktop, desktop or laptop? A laptop. Okay, from a laptop, you should be able to, from your dashboard, see the annotate option. Um, members of the team here, can, of the Emerge team, can you actually see that annotate option? Mm -hmm. I can see it up there. Can you um, see it with screen share? I can see it, but it, 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 it uh, Click on it. What happens when you click on it? it, it I don't think you can see it with the screen share. I actually have a screen share here. That's where the map is coming from. Okay. I think we may end up having to put this one down to experience. It appears that, that what, what we are seeing is just the shot from your, from your screen, but not a two bar on, on our Zoom control. Okay, my, my suggestion is that maybe what you need to do is get out of full screen, get out of full screen view, and then you might be able to get, get access to your dashboard again. Try that. It's not. Still not working. I go to 50% view. I still don't have it. Yes, same with me. Yeah. That's very strange. I, I can see it, but it's not active. Okay. It's Look, I'm not responsive. Yeah. It's I'm not responsive. It's grayed out. Could you, actually, could you come up with your annotation well. options as the presenter? Press the I have actually. I've actually in the security, I've said allow participants to annotate on shared content. Could you come out of your um, annotation options as the presenter, press the red cross on the, your annotation options. Okay, uh, let me just decline that, red cross and annotation options. Um, red cross has already been pressed, that's done. Uh, okay. Mm. I just wanted... Okay. Well, Okay, so look, I don't think we're going to get this one sorted out right now. We actually have some, we actually have some stars here in South Africa. Some people have actually annotated. So it seems a bit weird that some have access to the annotation options and do, some do not have access to those options. I think we should probably just move on from here rather than um, spending a lot of valuable time on this. If it's, not, if it's not working for people in the room. Okay, so I'm going to unshare that. Okay, and I'm going to try and resume sharing um, on the presentation. Okay, how difficult can online facilitation be? And we're going back. Um, whoops. Okay, grid view and going ahead and right back. an example of how difficult it can be. <laughs> and it's interesting, isn't it? Um, oh, yeah. Um, right, we'll continue from there. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, now I have an acknowledgement to make. The acknowledgement is that the materials in this event are modified from an open resource developed for the Center for Innovation and Learning and Teaching at UCT. And in turn, this new version of the presentation is also shared with the Creative Commons attribution license. And I'd also like to say welcome to colleagues from the Association, International Association of Facilitators. Um, and is there somebody in the room from IAF who'd like to just say a few words? Perhaps you could raise your hand. John is here. John, would you like yeah. to talk briefly? Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm John Cornwell. I'm in Mombasa in Kenya. I'm responsible for communications within IAF Africa. And IAF is the International Association of Facilitators. We represent about 2,000 professional facilitators globally, about 110 in Africa currently. Um, it's a great place for networking and professional development. I think that's the end of my advert, but I'll put a couple of uh, 
links in the chat box if anybody would like to follow up on that. Thank you. How interesting, how fascinating that the annotation works on some things but not on others. Okay, and thank you very much, John, for introducing the IAF. Okay, and can you please remove your annotation, perhaps? Maybe not so easy to do that. I think at this point, I'm actually going to stop participants annotating on shared content. This is enough, folks. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and also what I'd like to do is to um, start a poll here about your experience of online facilitation. How much experience have you had of online facilitation? Whether you've had no previous experience, limited previous experience, lots of online facilitation, or if you're an expert online facilitator. The poll should be launched now. Okay. It's fluctuating a bit. Okay, keep those answers coming. Okay, so we have 127 people answered so far, about 152. Okay, 128, I think we might be maxing out there. So we have um, 36 or 28% no previous experience, 65 or 50% limited previous experience, 25 or 19% have um, a lot of previous experience of online facilitation and three regard themselves as expert online facilitators. Thank you, that's good to, good to know about. Okay, and then um, let's talk about, let's have another poll, which is about your sector, the sector within which you operate. Are you from secondary education, higher education, government, NGOs or nonprofit, private or corporate sector? Where are you from in terms of your sector? Okay. 105, 110. Okay, 127 answered so far, 129. Let's give it another few seconds. Oh, wow. In terms of the fact that um, Emerge Africa is focused on higher education. It's interesting that 82% of you are from higher education, 1% from secondary, 2% from government, 7% from non-governmental non organizations, and 8% from private or corporate sector. Okay, so um, at that point, this point, I could have actually done another poll about your work but um, in the last minute preparations for this event, I have to say that I forgot how, forgot to actually get that poll done. Um, firstly, thank you very much for all the burning questions that were submitted. I think we must have had probably 40, 45 questions submitted this morning. Um, some of which we are, some of which are already integrated into this event and some of which will come up later in the event. Um, and the journey we're going to be on today. Um, setting the scene, why are we here? What's facilitation, on to online facilitation? What is it that online facilitators do? Um, we had in the original version two facilitation dilemmas. I've taken it down to one to ensure that um, it becomes a simpler design some advice for when it's wanted and the facilitating online course from um, Emerge Africa. Um, I can't tell you how annoying that annotation is, but it is very instructive. Um, yeah, one interesting resource for facilitators, and I'm sure many of the people from IAF already know this resource, is the GroupWorks card deck at groupworksdeck.org which is a set of OER 
um, cards about many, many different aspects of facilitation, not specifically online, but the generic core issues of facilitation, which extend across online and face-to-face. -face. Um, if you look at the question of what facilitation is, this seems to be a decent um, definition from the ASTD handbook. The act of engaging participants in creating, discovering, and applying learning insights. Um, and from a different perspective, we have Sam Kainer in 1996. The facilitator's job is to support everyone to do their best thinking. So it's about encouraging participation, promoting mutual understanding, cultivating shared responsibility. Okay, another slide from the group works deck. Heart is a very important part of facilitation. And then moving to online facilitation. And there what we're doing is we are moving into a different kind of process. We're moving into a process where we're trying to encourage interaction with and between students or participants, supporting learning activities and helping make the use of tech easier for the people we're working with to foster greater engagement and learning. So it's all about engagement. It's all about learning. It's all about support for people to do the best that they can and enlist their best thinking. Another definition from Nancy White, a balance between functions that enhance the environment and content, create openness and opportunity. Um, sacred rituals around freedom of individual expression, preserving something of the common good, juggling, tightrope walking, often without a net. A few minutes ago, I felt like I was falling through that net um, <laughs> when that screen share of the map didn't work, but fortunately it wasn't very far to fall. Um, one of the conceptual framings, which is very well known, um, and yes, we'll clean up this presentation, give you a cleaned up version without the annotation um, when we share it after the event. Jilly Salmon's five stage model for how you engage your participants, your students in online courses. And it starts out with the kind of access and motivation stage, um, which is where you're basically saying, okay, have we got the system set up? Is it accessible? And can our participants actually get into the space and notice that they're there? Second stage is online socialization. People noticing each other and engaging with each other, just simply as human beings. Third stage, information exchange, swapping information about something, something that's useful to you and to others. And then knowledge construction, a level beyond that. Making knowledge together from shared thinking and shared creation. And then the fifth stage is development where you're basically saying, let's look outside the safety of our um, environment, online environment. Let's see what's happening outside. Let's think about what we're doing after this course and um, go out into the world from whatever process we've been involved in. Of course, we know this is not all sequential, that we do actually have um, people who join um, a course and right at the beginning, they are um, engaged in knowledge construction and information exchange. This does happen. Um, but I think it's a kind of checklist as to what are the things that you need to be sure you have in place, particularly for new participants in online courses and online development processes. Okay, at this point, um, I'd just like to ask Irene if you have any questions that you've harvested from the chat that um, you think need an answer now. Um, actually, Nicola is, is in the chat. Nicola, do you have one or two questions that need? Um, not really. Just my own observation that I wondered about the um, sort of relevance of the five-stage model given emergency remote teaching. My sense is many of us rush to development. 
Um, I think it has relevance because the trouble is that if you don't allow time for students to get into the environment and feel confident that they can actually do things um, and you put too much pressure on your participants to start producing very, very quickly, this then means that you have gaps in that process of engagement, particularly for students who haven't got a lot of digital literacies or a lot of online, exper online learning experience. It's not the same as engaging in social media. Um, but yes, it is, it's, it's a bit, a very, very stepwise, very sequential, but we know that people don't always off, operate sequentially. And we know that once you've actually been through a process in one online course, it might be you get into the next one and then you find that you're right back at the beginning because the interface perhaps is a bit different to what you used to. And until you figured that one out, you can't actually operate in your, you know, collaborative team mode, um, engaged in constructing knowledge, etc. So there are, are some elements that are certainly still relevant about the model. Okay, the next model that I just want to pick up on um, is the community of inquiry framework um, from work by Garrison Anderson and Archer. And what it basically says is that you have to think about three different kinds of presences. Social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. And the social presence is that we are there as a community. The cognitive presence is we are there and we are able to think together. And the teaching presence is you as an educator um, being very clear and very present as educator. So what you need is this kind of overlap between social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence for a really, really good educational experience to happen. And if you're missing one of them, so for example, um, you come into the space, you're determined to teach, you're determined to get people thinking together, um, but you're not interested in anything else about your participants, their experiences of the world outside the course, the emotions that they're bringing with them, um, things that may happen in their lives. Um, you're going to have something which falls flat and falls short and loses people. And you could do the same with any of the others. If you leave out the cognitive presence, people just have a good time and have fun um, but um, they never reach the levels of thinking that are required. Okay, um, and here's a little, and Aurelia will get you in a, in a minute, a little word cloud that we did about the things that online facilitators do. And this includes a lot of modeling and encouraging and improvisation and coaching and mentoring and curating and supporting and mediating and convening and nudging. There are so many things that online facilitators do. Aurelia, I see you raised your hand. Is there something you want to say? No, thank you. It was by mistake. Go on, Tony. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, the work that I did with colleagues a while back while designing the facilitating online course um, led us to think about what are the capabilities of online facilitators and we determined that there were five core categories of capabilities there was the category of supporting online learning the category of social skills um, are you able to engage with human beings as another human being essentially the category of online communication skills can you use the technologies and communication tools available to you to communicate in ways that are accessible and engaging and useful? Your technical skills, do you know the tools? And are you familiar and comfortable with them? And then your social networking skills, um, can you use social media? And I know in the past, people used to think that you could use Facebook as a teaching environment, but are less convinced of that now of, after events in the last few years. 
but there are still a lot of people who are using different kinds of social networking tools because they know that's where a lot of their participants and a lot of their students live a lot of the time. So essentially you need to have all of those five categories of skills in order to have really good capabilities for online facilitation and that is what the facilitating online focuses on, particularly the first four, and then towards the end also the fifth one, the social networking skills. And again from Nancy White, who has done amazing work in online facilitation over many decades. Um, she said that the facilitative stance involves self-awareness, tolerance for ambiguity, the ability to sense subtlety, well-practiced questioning and listening, that you can work across diverse cultures and styles, that you have the judgment to deal with the darker side of online interactions. When things not just go wrong, but they go wrong in weird and potentially horrible ways, or you can see it's heading that way and you figure out how you're going to deal with it. So those are all um, different approaches that people have taken to thinking about online facilitation and what's needed for good online facilitation. And right now, I would actually recommend that you take a chance to get up and stretch and move because you've been sitting for too damn long and you don't have to necessarily make like that cat, but take a minute minutes or so to just get up and move around and to um, see where you are. Okay. Um, I think the order of this might be slightly wrong and let's see where we are. Okay, I've had, I hope you've had a chance to have a good stretch. Colleagues, we're going to go and look at a scenario to check how we are for the time. We're doing very well for time at the moment. We're going to have a look at a scenario. We're going to actually end up in breakout rooms with colleagues and you're going to um, get out your, your scenario. We'll talk about the scenario, scenario very shortly and you'll prepare an answer um, as a group. And let me tell you the scenario here. The scenario here is that you have a participant who has been making very insightful and useful contributions to online discussions in your course and suddenly starts posting lots of messages advertising products that they are selling and then responds and gets very angry in the forum when their peers, the people with them in the course, object to this. And you're starting to worry a bit about this as a facilitator. What would you do as a facilitator or lecturer of the course? That essentially is going to be your scenario. And the process we're going to go through is like this. Firstly, you'll get a chance to think about the scenario by yourself and take down some little notes about what's happening in that scenario. Then we'll move you into breakout rooms with eight or nine colleagues. Maybe less because we, we're not as um, heavily populated as we thought we would be. That's good. Then in the breakout room, we'll have a round of very brief introductions. You'll get a chance to discuss the question in the group. Um, there will be a slide in the scenario slide deck in the folder that we've shared, which is marked with the number of your room, the number of your group. And then when you are getting ready to come back to the main room, have two sentences and your group number ready to enter in the text chat when you're prompted after you can return to the main room. Um, and let's just think about this, about the numbers that we have. We currently have, let's say 163. So if we had, um, well, we can actually easily have, instead of having um, eight or nine per room, we can easily have five, four or five per room. And you can work out the maths of that, Jakob, when you're setting up the rooms. So maybe we could actually then go for 
um, for 30 rooms and keep the, keep the group sizes fairly small so you can have much more productive discussion. Okay, and we're not going there yet. So if you want to um, think about the scenario, you have a situation where your participant has been amazing until now. They've been doing great work, taking part really productively in the discussions, posting interesting messages. And suddenly what they start doing is posting lots of messages where they're advertising some products that they're selling. Um, their classmates do not like this at all. Their classmates start objecting. The student, the participant keeps going. The classmates object more. There is a level of, um, let's say, resentment, which is starting to maybe turn into a bit of anger on both sides. And you have to make some choices as to the strategy that you're having as a lecturer or facilitator. So think about the scenario by yourself now for a minute or two. And then after that, we'll move you into the break, breakout rooms. Um, Jakob, before you do that, could you please share the, um, the tiny URL for the folder so people can actually then keep this URL with them and then from their rooms they could then access the slide deck for the scenarios and find the right slide for their room. Thank you. Okay, um, and Jakob, can you indicate when you're ready to move people into the breakout rooms? Okay, you can activate your mic when you're ready and tell us. All right, uh, thank you, Tony. Um, I see I can make uh, 34 breakout rooms. And uh, Tony, you give me a cue. Uh, can, you, can, you can, you, can you take it to 30 uh, breakout rooms? We only have slide, um, <laughs> slides in the deck for, for 30. Not a problem. Okay, cool. Um, what's going to happen is we'll move into the breakout room. So if you hadn't been in a breakout room before, you're going to get a request to join the room. You have to actually say join, click on join in order to go into the room. Um, and then while you're in the room, we'll send you messages about to basically help you keep a bit to the timing. So you'll be ready to have um, your slide with your answers, able to share with everybody else and have your two sentences max ready to share in the chat um, after returning. So, Jakob, um, are you going to send people to the rooms? I am going to do that now. It's okay. my first time, so hopefully they will work. Actually, actually, sorry, and could, could we allow, I think let's allow, let's allow 20 minutes. Um, and there'll probably be a countdown timer for a minute before you come back. And give us a countdown, the four, three, two, one, um, Jakob, before you send people to the rooms. All right, I'm ready to press a few buttons on this side. So uh, I th I'm not gonna do the countdown, but I'll see it'll, it'll happen in uh, just a few seconds. Okay, there you go. So we're back and thank you very much. And I hope the back breakout rooms were at least an interesting experience. And uh, maybe you can just type a little bit into the, into the chat about um, your experience of being in the breakout rooms. What was it like being in the breakout rooms? So, so Jerome had people from Zimbabwe, Kenya, Somalia, Nigeria, Sudan. Tell us about your breakout room, just a little bit about it. In the chat. Interactive, oh, that's good. Fun, exciting, good, nice. Okay, for some people it was the first time in a Zoom breakout room. It's one of the better things about Zoom that you can use breakout rooms. 
Okay, interacting. Yeah, I'm sorry, only two of the five members of the group of 27, part, group 27 participate, that's a problem. But I hope the two were very interactive. Okay, so interaction does come up a lot here. Now, I think some people got bombed out. I'm blitting them back in here, back into the space. And, um, right, after unmuting, you had to take responsibility to unmute yourselves. Very important. And in some groups, there were a lot of people who were quiet. Okay, everybody in group 20, because you were there, Karen. That's why everyone in group 20 took part. Okay, so colleagues, from your breakout rooms, you have a presumably agreed on one or two sentences that you should be able to put into the chat. What I want to ask you to do is, don't send the message yet, but take a minute to type your message into the text box, and I'll allow you a minute to type your message into the text box about, don't tell us your answers yet, Type your message with your two sentence answer into the text box from one person per group. Tell us the group number, tell us, put your message into the text box. And after a minute, I will tell you to go and send all the messages and all the messages will come up in one flurry. So enter the message in the text box, but don't send it yet. Okay, I'll give you a minute to do that. Okay. When you're ready to send, I'm going to say four, three, two, one, send. Send your message. Woo! Okay. Roosters, how wonderful. Somebody's in the countryside with roosters. Okay, so a lot of messages coming through here from many different groups. And now you can scroll back a little bit and see what you can find here from the groups. And let's maybe get a few people to talk about um, their, what came up in their group. Oh my, Vera from group 24 has like four paragraphs, but really, really interesting stuff. Private chat. Ground rules, communicate to the class to calm down. Calm down, people. Why don't, why don't get so upset about this? And you, call, you, don't have, you don't have to advertise here. Okay, last option is to disconnect. Oh my, okay. Um, and then Jai from room four. Ground rooms. Turn the experience into a learning opportunity. Worst case scenario, kick the student out. And this is an online classroom. How do you kick a student out of an online classroom without kicking them out the course altogether? Guidelines, ground rules. Okay. Room 17, rules. Okay, <laughs> privately talk to the student afterwards. Okay, rules, rules, rules. Rules come up everywhere. And then <laughs> Jerome, and I think also Amina in the early, one of the groups said, I will first talk with the student privately to resolve the problem. Okay, rules, 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 contract, agreement. Um, Ian Seaborger, ground rules, ground rules, ethics of care. Um, Ian, would you want to say something about the ethic of care? Can you unmute yourself and talk about the ethic of care? Well, in our discussion um, that came up um, and one of our participants was saying, this needs to come in the context of a sort of ethic of care for students. Um, where you know quite a bit about your students and um, you've researched them um, a bit about their backgrounds um, and yeah you you get to know them to the extent that um, you can know how and um, perhaps this particular student would respond to um, criticism and um, what how exactly to word that private message when you send the private message to this particular student who seems to be transgressing the rules now yeah 
I mean, I think that's very important. A question came up in the Padlet about care and relationship for students. And ethics of care is a really, really vital issue, particularly in the current scenario, where you don't know for sure what's happening with your students who are spread out all over the countryside and possibly over several countries, depending on um, what you're teaching and, and, and where they're from. And you don't know if their stu these students have gone back to very difficult circumstances at home. You don't know if the student is um, sitting with a family where somebody has died of coronavirus. You don't know if the student is sitting in a situation where the family have lost their income and people have not been able to work for a long time and the financial struggles are huge. So caring is really important and trying to understand the circumstances that the students are facing is important. For a lot of people, this is a very traumatic time. Um, and it's trying to teach students who are experiencing some kind of trauma um, is not like your kind of normal teaching. Um, so ethics of care does surface as a very important issue. Okay. Uh, is there one other person who would like to talk to us about your, about what happened in your group? Please activate your mic and talk to us. Tony, may I say something? Please do. Uh, Tony, one of the, I was in group six. Okay. I think Gela was about to talk. Thank you, Tony. Um, just uh, a group um, uh, came up with, uh, with all of the, the suggestions that you've just had, but one of the other suggestions that one of the group members made, a lady called Jane, was that um, some, some platforms actually make, uh, have a chat room or a tea room or a break room available, which is, um, runs you know, differently to, to the actual um, forum that uh, you're doing your academic teaching on where students can go and chat about non-academic uh, stuff, you know, tell one another, um, possibly place their adverts, that kind of thing. So that might also be a, a great idea if the technology allows for it. The technology always allows for it. It's the choices that you make that are important here. So you can decide to have a kind of lounge forum. You can decide to have a forum or a space that's just for adverts if people are into small business. You know, you can, you can actually decide and agree with your students as to how that works. One thing you don't do is have no spaces for any social or non-course interaction and then get cross when students start having those conversations in the middle of a serious forum because there are no safety valves. I think that's quite important that there are, you have to build those kind of safety valves and those more relaxed social spaces in, in some way. Even if most students decide not to use them because they'd rather be in Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, that's up to them. But you need to allow that space. Um, and I just really want to say that everybody seems to have come to the, say, the right kinds of approaches um, some stricter than others, some more inclined to basically say this is a disciplinary issue without even talking with the student and finding out what's going on. I think that's an important component. But a lot about is it a rule, is it a guideline? Do you basically say these are the rules or do you actually have a discussion with the students? And essentially earlier in the course you should really probably have some kind of discussion so the students understand what the guidelines are and agree that these are useful and important to them. Um, I'm going to move on now. So what I'm going to do is to um, mute. We'll, what we'll do is we'll share the answers in the chat and the slides remain available to you for reference later on. And we'll also make the answers from the slides um, available in an easier form later on. I'm going to mute everybody. I'm going to return to sharing um, because there are a few things we still need to get through before we end here. Okay, and you can unmute, your, you, you can, can unmute yourself when we're talking later, but at the moment I need to go back to the screen share. Um, and where are we? Yes. Um, okay. 
got so excited here I've actually gone and lost where my presentation was. Okay, found again. Let's go there. Okay. Um, right. Let's carry on and just get, get into view mode. Uh huh. Okay, so you've actually, you should have it, your answers in the scenario responses. Um, again, another issue about heart, which is where we follow the energy. And often what you do is you need to actually see what's going on and work with the energy that's available to you rather than trying to impose your agenda and see what's happening with the group. Okay, so where are we? We're in a situation where Online facilitation um, has got a long history, but it keeps going. It's becoming increasingly relevant again. And a lot of it's about connecting students to each other, to educators and to learning. And especially in the current scenario, with the shifts towards remote teaching, um, it has become crucial to the effectiveness of mainstream university educators and to mainstream trainers, the rush of people moving into online teaching and training this year has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I think this probably means that we are experiencing some kind of longer term shift. Um, the facilitating online course is available um, through Emerge Africa. It runs for about it runs for eight weeks, five weeks of programmed activities. Week zero, which is really this kind of get your tech set up, get into the course, feel confident that you can actually arrive there. And then after week two, we have a consolidation week for reflection and catch up. We do the same after week four. And we even often allow people after week five, um, which is eight weeks into the whole process to have a little bit more time for catch up because typically the people we recruit are really busy people. Currently we're recruiting educators and trainers from across the world for the run in September. Um, and possibly somebody could post the link to the course information in the text chat, that would be helpful. And um, this course is a short course at UCT, University of Cape Town with the certificate of completion. Um, what I'd like to do is to ask for the, a couple of people who've been in the course um, and got the certificate to talk a little bit about why they think other people, other colleagues here who haven't done it yet, should consider doing the course. Relitza, can you um, take your mic and talk to us for a couple of minutes? Okay, thank you so much, Tony, and uh, I hope I'm audible. You certainly are. <laughs> okay, so thank you all for joining us today, and uh, I will really say that the facilitating online course is really, really a good course. If you are looking for the skills that you need to host an online event or manage activities online, then the right course for you to do is the facilitating online course. The course itself is very flexible and you can act, actually do it at your own pace. It's, it's very much of a asynchronous. So, and then we combine it with a little bit of um, synchronous sessions like this today. And I must say that when I came to this course, I didn't know much about facilitation. And then um, this course really gave me the skills that I needed to be able to work online. And now, I can comfortably host um, activities online and also host events. So I would um, say that please, please, please sign up for this year's, um, I mean, the last one for this year, and then come and have a wonderful experience with us. Thank you so much. And I would like to hand over the mic once again to Tony. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ralitza. This is Ralitza Debra um, from Ghana, um, who, a couple of weeks ago gave an incredibly powerful webinar about um, online education post-COVID-19 through Emerge Africa. 
Um, and I think, Neil, are you in the room? Could you take the mic? Hi, oh, yes, Tony, I'm here. Please introduce yourself and tell us about why you think people should take facilitating online. All right, fantastic. My name is Neil Crum. I'm currently at Rhodes University in, in the Eastern Cape. Um, I did the facilitating online course in the beginning of 2018, starting, starting a new role. And I never knew how, how awesome it would be um, and how useful it, it, it really became in, in, in my role. I, by chance, really by luck, signed up. Um, but I do, do want to say the, the, the most powerful part of this is, is the experiential learning. Um, you know, we, we learn how to design things and we create, we create courses. And in my role, I had to, to support other people creating courses online. Um, and this course really gave me the tools to, to actually transfer and, and model this behavior to, um, to, to, to the lectures I was supporting. Um, you know, it, it, it ties into what Tony was saying, you know, the course actually does instill with you that the, the way to support online learning, but, but also it improved my online communication skills. I actually thought I was okay, but when it were after, once, once we're in that space, working with, with, with you know, the best facilitators, um, you actually see how much you can, you can always improve. Um, and of course, you become part of a of of, of a growing network of, of of people that have completed it, which is probably the biggest bonus. So yeah, I, I would suggest you try and get it, get into it. It's it's really fantastic. It's fun. Um, it Neil, thank you very much. Learning. Thank you. And Olafemi, are you in the room? If so, do you want to talk to us, and just say who you are first, uh, and then your reasons? Yeah. Yes, thank you, uh, Tony. I am Olufemi Olubodo from University of Lagos. Uh, I did facilitating online course about four or five years ago. Uh, you, uh, really, it was uh, an interesting experience. I must tell you that um, facilitating online will teach you how to use technology to communicate. And it defines the differences between behavior online and in face-to-face. -face. You really know the difference between the two. Uh, the, the behavior of your student face-to-face -face, definitely different from online. You will learn that. And uh, technologies, a lot of a number of technologies that I have never come across that helps in communication and teaching uh, uh, will, be, will be taught during facilitating online. And one very important thing is the sense of community building. You're able to build community. Uh, yes, I facilitate after my sabbatical leave from a, uh, a college in Nigeria. And uh, on return, I've been hosting a lot of Zoom meeting. I got to know Zoom first from Tony. Tony. I was using Adobe Connect before. Now he suggested it for the first time. And since then, uh, I've been using Zoom and it's been very awesome. Uh, these are the things you learn from uh, facilitating a lot online, a lot of technologies. When I prepare my slides to present online, I learn a lot of how to use different emoji, different colors, ways of presenting, so interesting and so catchy to the student. These are things that I learned from facilitating online. Uh, above all, community building, you would le really like uh, learning from facilitating online. Thank you. Olofemi, thank you very much, and thank you to Neil, and thank you to Alitza as well. Um, I'd like to just pick up on a couple of the other questions that came up in the Padlet. There was a question about facilitating across different disciplines. The truth of the matter is so much of what happens in your facilitation is about you, your personality, and your relationship with the students. Um, and that means that people have different styles of facilitation, which are not necessarily dependent on discipline. Um, I have met, for example, accounting lecturers who are really, really warm people and actually show their humanity in um, the course of their accounting lectures, which makes for a better relationship and better communication and students who feel safer and more engaged. Um, if you have your mic on currently, um, and you are sniffing loudly, please mute your mic. Thank you. Um, 
one interesting question that came up, which actually asserted for me the rural nature of much of our continent. How do I facilitate the practical components of demonstration, e.g. castration of co goats in an online environment? Um, and I think there what you talk to talking about really is using different kinds of tools. So for example, you might be using a little bit of cell phone video. You may be um, sharing some um, animated GIFs online. There may be different ways, but really it's about the communication tools that you're using. And I think as a facilitator, um, things don't necessarily change so much. I think this is much more of a direct tools for teaching kind of question. There is another question, which is about how to good, do good online facilitation, where the majority of your students have limited network and data access. And there, what that means essentially is that you end up with a far greater emphasis on asynchronous. You're not going to do most of your teaching in Zoom because people don't have the data and people don't have the bandwidth for, for that. So you need to be very thoughtful about the context of your students. I would not recommend that you use Zoom as a main tool for any course where students um, have issues around the affordability of data and where students have issues around um, bandwidth and access in their area. Um, I see there are a couple of people that had their hands up. I see Alice had her hand up first. Would you like to talk? Yes, I was just going to say something about the data there, especially things like sharing a screen or whatever. If you break it up into 30 minute uh, session and then have them do asynchronous things and then come back for another 30 minute check in or something. But we even, we used a lot of Microsoft Teams and the big problem was when you needed to show them the screen, which was all the time. That's when yeah. they lost everything else. So they lost audio. You so, have to be very careful. Yeah, and um, these were not students, these were lecturers, so it was a big problem. Thank you. When the lecturers are the ones having the problem, you know that you're in a, a difficult situation. And this, this occurs with some of the top universities across Africa as well. Ulubisayo, you had your hand up. Do you want to talk to us? Please activate your mic and talk to us. Okay, you're not there. Um, and then there were the questions about psychological isolation, coping strategies, and care and connection. The ethics of care um, raised by Rob Seaborger, very important to think about care and connection, the online space, if it's important face-to-face, -face, it's also important online, even more important where it's easier for people to get isolated and just disappear one way or another. Um, and it really is about also what um, well, the family was talking about, about growing community where people feel a sense of being held in a community, not just in the relationship with the lecturer who may or may not have time to really engage because lecturers are facing a lot of pressure these days. And coping strategies to deal with the demands for online facilitation. If you're an online facilitator, you have to take care of yourself. You have to ensure that you have enough rest. You have to ensure that you have enough exercise, that you're eating well, that you have enough um, time with people who care about you and you care about in your close personal life. Otherwise, you're just going to get depleted and end up being no good to anybody, including the students. And it's very important that you model an approach to sustainability and self-care and that you don't then push too much onto students um, who are facing very difficult circumstances and may even be feeling directly traumatized. So how you take care of yourself and how you take care of your students are very, very interwoven. And that's a way to actually then focus on breaking that isolation of students and lecturers as well. And it's fine to say, um, I will only be responding to messages these kinds of times of the day. If you send me a message at three o'clock in the morning, I will not see this message till I get going at whatever it is, 7.30, 8.30, whatever it is you, you actually signal. And then I will start responding to messages. Um, it's very important that students have realistic expectations of you and know when you're accessible, when you're not accessible, 
and um, what it is that you actually can do. Um, and if they actually understand the score, um, it means that it reduces their level of anxiety as well. Um, and there were many other questions that, that were answered and other questions that were not answered. We're going to use the questions from the Padlet to possibly design further events as well in this series. And folks, we're getting close to the scheduled end time. Um, and here's information about Emerge Africa and our address. Um, there's a whole other section to this presentation, which is basically a bonus feature with a set of advice about online facilitation, which you'll be able to access and read for yourselves. And now what I'd like to ask you is if you can um, come into the chat and basically, and thanks for those contact details, John, about IAF, very important, um, major resource to facilitators all around the world. If you can come into the text chat and you can actually just say in the text chat what you're leaving with in terms of your thinking, your impressions, your emotions, what are you bringing away with you when you leave this meeting? And if you can just say that in the text chat. And thank you to all of you for being here. What are you taking away? And your brain and your feelings and your ideas about plans for the future. Ayatollah, breakout. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pretty Moyo and Tula Vilakati. Okay. Keep those messages coming. And just notice what you're saying to each other as well, because you made this happen together. What happened in the breakout rooms was up to you. And I'm hoping that many of you will come join us in um, facilitating online in September or another time. And keep the conversation about online facilitation going. We'll probably run a couple more webinars about online facilitation, picking up on questions which we couldn't answer here because we didn't have, have, have a lot of time. Thanks, Nicola. Urbasayo. Deborah, Samuel, Chenna. We'll stick around in this room for a little while after you've finished sending your messages through, your closing messages. Um, and if you, anyone wants to engage in conversation afterwards, follow up conversation, you're also welcome to that. Gabriel, I have a whole collection of backgrounds, including some very bright flower backgrounds from Kirstenbosch Gardens in Cape Town, which would um, be too distracting to have in a relatively serious event like this, I think. And thank you to Neil and to Ralitza and Olafemi for talking about facilitating online. Thank you to Irene and to Jakob and to Nicola from the Emerge team from the support you're giving in the background as well. There's a lot about the ethics of care that's important here, but there's also something about trauma-informed teaching, which has become really important um, in this time, especially although it was before. Thank you. Okay, and Chris P. U. Um, thanks for your message too, and Tolilope. 
And I think it may be good for us to have an event about the ethics of care at some point as well. And I see people are leaving the room and you're free to leave the room when you're finished. Or if you want to stick around and have a bit more conversation, um, we'd certainly be open for that, me and other people in the team. And Irene's shared information with a feedback form as well. And we'll mail you the feedback form if, so you'll get the, the link if you weren't um, in the room when the information got circulated. The recording will be shared. We may do slight edits to the recording, um, but the core of this recording is going to be shared. Thank you, everybody. Okay. So if anybody wants the mic and wants to talk and ask a question or uh, share an insight, you'd be welcome to do that. And I'm not going to admit anyone new from the waiting room at this point. <laughs> Should I? Maybe. Okay, so who wants the mic? Please raise your hand. And please take the mic. Talk to us. Thanks for the nice presentation. Thanks, Mali Beaver. Yes, we yes. Can, no, the voice is uh, good. Yeah, yes, all right, thanks. Now I wanted to ask something because regarding the, the scenario you gave us, you know, I think here we had a student who is good, but it happened that it, later on, he, he actually posted something about advertisement which was not relevant to the course. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other participants or other students were the ones who were actually to 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 to, to stop the, the the student from doing so, so it kind of gave me something because I was thinking whether if it's gonna be the students who who will say, "Man, stop it! This is not right." You know, it. I think there will be sort of 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 breaking of relationships. You know for future engagements or something. Because if your colleague is going to say whatever they want to say later on regarding what we have done, it means that your future engagement with your colleagues will somehow be negatively affected. Then it gave me something to say, wouldn't it be better for you to have a rule that says in an event where a student sees something wrong with the engagements, you know, in your platforms. The first reference point should be the lecturer, and then it should be the lecturer that will address that. I'm not sure if, 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 if you're getting what I'm trying to say. I get what you're trying to say, um, because basically you're saying there was a good community operating before, and the moment you start getting students disciplining each other, that there could yes. be a rift in that community. But on the other hand, you could say that in normal life, you do not have a headmaster or a teacher to go to, to sort out your problems for you. And when you think something is wrong, that in a community where people care about each other and listen to each other, we are accountable to each other. So in a way, the fact that the students, other students are saying you are accountable to us as well, and we do not like this. There is no problem with that because it basically is giving the person the signal which says what you're doing is not actually right because it doesn't meet with the standards of our community as a course. Um, and that the students have actually taken this on for themselves. At the, I think it's a problem where it starts to become angry rather than a conversation that people sort things out. Um, because you know, if everybody always has to sort things out with the lecturer, it puts so much responsibility on the lecturer to be the, be the one who says what is right and what is wrong. Rather than the students actually coming to some kind of consensus and going, yeah, this is how it is. Any other perspectives on this? Please take the mic and talk to us. Somebody else want to reply? Don't be so quiet, please. Uh, uh, Tony, I think uh, 
maybe I may come in here. Go on, Alexander. This is good. Your voice, your sound is good. Okay. Uh, I, I think, um, yes, uh, to say right or wrong, a lot of pressure on the lecturer of who is uh, facilitating. Also me, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but uh, nevertheless, I think um, uh, just like we said, a sense of community uh, in online setup has to be uh, well um, guarded jealously so that you don't lose the, uh, a good relationship, no doubt. But however, no. there will be a time you call a spade a spade and uh, you are not going to apply the maximum penalty. Uh, in my group, I said there should be a, a room for suspension, not outright ban, so that uh, the fellow may rethink and uh, change his way and rejoin the, the group again. I think that's the way to go. Yeah, there's something about accountability and community. I think that's really important. Um, but I don't think you want to get to maximum, maximum um, discipline unless you've actually gone through a whole lot of other steps, including understanding what's going on for the student. So uh, our colleague, uh, Mali Viva, did you understand what was going on for the student concerned? Did you try to find out what was happening with them and why they were suddenly doing these strange things? Please unmute yourself. Yes, actually I was in group 24. Part of what we discussed about was us sending a private message to the mm -hmm. student trying to interrogate what was happening with the students. Yeah. So I was just trying to make a follow up on that, but I was trying to say maybe the approach where, you know, he's going to get a, a shambok from the other colleagues, you know, no, who belongs to the same class, may not be right. But now I understand what, they, after you have explained, I think I get what you are trying to say. I think this can stop short of Shambok. <laughs> and I think it would, it would be worse, it would be worse in a face to face setting, I suspect, because nobody can Shambok you online. Yes. <laughs> People can be horrible to you, but they can't Shambok you. <laughs> All right. So thanks, Tony, for your and also all of him for the for your contribution, guys. I think it, it has assisted me a lot. Okay. Does somebody else want to come in, and maybe um, either talk about this or something else that you want to ask or talk about around around online facilitation? Um, this um, is Margaret. I'm Margaret. I'm from Ethiopia, or let's say I'm posted in Ethiopia. Um, I have another question. I'm in the Ethiopian Institute for Higher Education and we discuss a lot now about uh, online learning and I have seen in the chat uh, two persons by a public university can join the, the course. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many people per country. We have 47 universities in Ethiopia and I can bring this directly to the ministry and the ministry brings them further. Um, how many people per country could participate? Our need is tremendous. Okay, so let's think about this in terms of logistics, as well as the, the kind of ethics in the, in the community. In terms of logistics, um, we have the capacity, currently we're running the course three times a year. If there was demand for it, we could consider upping that to four or five times a year. Mm -hmm. um, we have running, we've been running some of the instances of the course earlier this year and last year with around 30 members per cohort. Um, we can easily manage 50. We could push it up to potentially 60 for a cohort by bringing in a bit of extra facilitation. Mm -hmm. But once we start going beyond that, given the intensity of the interaction, and the fact that there is no automated marking in this course. I don't think we can go, we, we, I think probably 70 per cohort would be our upper limit and that would be kind of, kind of hectic. Um, there is, we don't pose any particular limit on the number of people from a particular country. Um, but that's because in the past, I suppose, the interest in online facilitation has been rather niche. But now it's becoming mainstream. 
we may need to be thinking about how we would perhaps work with um, colleagues across Ethiopian universities to phase in Ethiopian participants across a number of cohorts of the course, because you need to have this, ex this experience of taking part with people from different regions and countries in Africa to get the full benefit of the course, mm -hmm. and also to work with some of the best and most enthusiastic people immediately. So it's possible then for colleagues from Ethiopia to start up offering the course themselves in Amharic. Uh, our uh, language of teaching is English. Oh, that's interesting. The language of teaching is English across the whole of Ethiopia. Yes. So, okay, so Amharic is what people use in casual conversation and at home in the community often, but yeah, okay. So English is the language and, and that would mean that if people from Ethiopia joined up with other people who had completed the course and started offering it, possibly as a consortium across different universities, there would then be an opportunity to attract people across different regions of Africa. And in the current period, it is not a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. there, is, there are opportunities to offer lots of instances of facilitating online a year from different institutions. And right from the beginning, one of the things we wanted is for people to use the open resources and to use those as guidance to start offering facilitating online themselves. Mm -hmm. I think this is the period where it may well start happening. I mean, we've got interest, for example, in translating the resources into French and into Portuguese and into Arabic in the future as well. Um, and I think Anglophone Africa and the parts of Africa that do university tuition in English is large enough in terms of potential demand that there would not be a sense of competition, there would be a sense of collegiality. And mm -hmm. I think that would be the route to take, not to say, put everybody through the course run by Emerge Africa from UCT. And I'd be very, very open to a discussion about the detail of this with you uh, privately, if you would like to discuss this um, outside the meeting as well. Yeah, I'll, definitely. I'll, I'll, Thank you very I'll, much, Tony. With Thank my you email. Very much. Okay, um, great. Hey, hey, Tony, can I, can I jump in? Please do. Hi, so thank you very much for the presentation. I have been resisting taking the course for some time, but, but, but because I just, I felt that, uh, I mean, like you said, it was a niche, you know, um, aspect to it. But now with COVID, we have been forced to go online very, very quickly. And um, I'm interested in looking at it from what you've just discussed um, for, from a training of trainers perspective. So yep. I'm with you, say you and to see how we can probably get a few people who may be interested to take the course and then go back and train other colleagues and so on. But it was very insightful, especially the, the, the social presence and, and, the, and the different scenario we did what was an eye opener. So thank you for that. Atieno, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, you've been somebody I've looked up to for a while given the roles that you play around research development and um, I could see that when people can meet face to face or do blended courses um, online facilitation is something that you think you can do without for a while but currently um, I think I think you need facilitating online I agree. Um, come and join us yes for sure <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Atieno. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else wants to talk? Hi, Tony. Matthew, talk to us. Yes. Sir. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I am just wondering if probably you might have a quick answer or possibly answer me another time. But uh, how can you balance a situation in which online facilitation has to be done promptly against um, not the very relevant resources. For example, you just have a personal computer and internet connection and your students, some of them do not have personal computers, probably they use their phones and learning has to go on. 
Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's the concern that I, I have. Okay, How this is... help in that regard? Yeah, Matthew, this is not primarily an issue of online facilitation. This is an issue of resourcing and um, inequality where you'll find some students are coming possibly from more established middle-class homes where they've got access to more of these kinds of resources and others um, really struggle with the resources and the tools, etc. And there what you need to do is think very carefully about having the lowest level of technology, which is um, compatible with actually having the possibility of learning. Um, and that means that there are some universities which don't even have online learning environments, which are making very good use of things like WhatsApp. There are some people who are making good use of basic email um, and are thinking about, okay, if the lowest common denominator is a kind of low budget medium or medium range smartphone, then what can you do with that? Um, so you may need to think in those kinds of ways and to think, think about a design which would allow students with fairly low end devices to gain benefit in terms of their learning and their access to resources and possibly students with um, more sophisticated devices and fast internet access being able to access resources in different ways. But the, the, tr the problem is to just try and make sure that your students who um, don't have a lot of access are not going to lose out completely. Um, even at the University of Cape Town, we are facing these, these challenges and basically going, we are providing data, we are providing laptops to many students who are on financial aid. Um, but um, we recognize that some students are still going to struggle, partly for tech reasons, partly because of other reasons around the conditions around their living and what, where they're living and what's happening in their families, etc., and in the communities. So we're actually going to set time aside for a kind of catch-up period for students who are really vulnerable in this current period. Um, and we're not going to be able to sort out everything through online learning. So th I think bear that in mind. There was a question that came in earlier, and I'm not sure where this was, from Charity. Um, who was basically saying, are there self-help resources? There are a far number of self, fair number of self-help resources available online. Um, one thing a person could do would just be to access our facilitating online course guidance, the OER, which has all of the course exercises and a lot of the explanation about how we think about online facilitation. That might be a way to do it. And there are a number of other online resources available. The trouble with engaging with those resources only is that it doesn't actually put you through an experiential process and which is what a, an online facilitation course does it's about being in the experience and reflecting on the experience well if Femi has a hand up talk to us yeah thank you Tony I think uh, the last time I remember we did uh, meet like this I mean the image group meet and um, everybody in like this was when we were using, um, I think, a Yahoo group. Uh, what about doing this from time to time, this way, Zoom yeah. meeting like this? Yeah. Um, the te specific technology maybe is not as important as actually growing the community. Um, and I think that there's more that we can do to, to be there. But um, we have hundreds of people who have been through the course. And it's time to pull people together with more of these kinds of events. So thank you very much for your support for that idea, Olufemi. Okay. Lucien, hi, Tom. talk to us. Yes, yes. Hi, hi, Tom. Nice to see you. And you, Lucien. I hope you can hear me now. Your sound is good. So I, I yeah, thank you. So I was thinking, given the situation now that we have of COVID-19, uh, first of all, my name is Lucien Geze. I am from Tanzania, and I'm a lecturer in the University of Dodoma here in Tanzania. So I was trying to see, uh, given the situation that we, ha we are in now of COVID-19, and I could, I, I'm sure that many of the lecturers and instructors are actually in the process of shifting and moving, and many of them are already in the process of teaching online. 
but they yes. miss these facilitation skills which are actually needed immediately. And I was trying to see, look at the, at the uh, I mean, the notes that you have shared about the, this uh, facilitation online course, and it is going to be offered in September. It, maybe right. it could be that many of them would like it to be done even earlier than that. Probably what you could be able to see is maybe you could be able to create a quick poster or, uh, or something to share with participants, maybe via their emails and then be able to broadcast to many people. And then thereafter, you could be able to get feedback from them, which could say probably they could be able, you could give them some suggestions of where they're able to lie. And then they would come up with something that would be able to suggest. Probably you don't know. It would be that they need this course maybe next month or even at the end of this month itself. So uh, based on what you share with them, probably, you could be able to get some insights that would be able to help them in, be able to uh, join the course and then be able to learn these facilitation skills and then be able to help them in the process as they move forward, as they work on the, in the online environment. That, was, that is what I was sharing, try, trying to share. I know even in Tanzania, even though uh, universities and colleges are back to life, but there are people who have been, uh, given the fact that we're in COVID-19, there are lecturers who have been able to try, to try uh, trying to uh, teach their courses online. So if this course is coming into picture and if they are given inf enough information, it could be easier for them to be able to participate as well because some of them have continued going on, moving on teaching online, given the fact that they are also having face-to-face -face sessions as well. So I Lucian, was trying to see whether that can be possible. Thank you very much. Um, just firstly, there's a question from Charity about details of the website for the resources posted in the chat. And if you have that information, um, the URL is sitting there waiting for you. Lucien, look, there are thousands of lecturers across our continent mm -hmm. who needed to have these facilitation skills like two and a half, three months ago when they didn't need them before. <laughs> um, and so we're actually faced with this issue of um, potentially huge demand for a course like facilitating online and quick, quick introductions to, to online facilitation. Um, and I think you've raised something important to us because we don't have the capacity as Emerge Africa to start running another instance of facilitating online right away, like tomorrow or next week. But we may have the capacity to start offering some short workshops online. So less presentation, much less presentation, much more experience, much more experiential learning. Um, and uh, for example, today, I felt like the balance between presentation and experiential learning was not perfect, but a lot of people were new to online facilitation. I would like to do something again in the future, not, not too far in the future, which is way more experiential and much less presentation time. How would that sound, Lucien? Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, that would be easier. And I, I'm sure that many of lecturers and, and instructors will be able to join and it would be helpful much to be able to, for them to be able to move forward as they join uh, the online teaching uh, scenarios. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Sound great, sound great, sound great. We are looking forward to it. Thank you, Olafemi, too. Okay, who else Ma is going Maria, to take the mic now? Maria has had a hand up for a while. Is a Maria, Maria there, talk please? to us. Maria, speak to us, please. You got bored with waiting for us. <laughs> Sorry. Maria, talk to us. Maria? Okay, maybe someone else wants to come in while we're waiting for Maria. Maria, talk to us, please. Sorry, you can't hear you. Can anyone hear Maria? I can see your, something's happening with your mic, but we couldn't hear you. Okay, I see you're typing in the chat. Meanwhile, does somebody else want to take the mic? And Maria, thank you for your participation in your questions earlier and your, and your insights about the scenario. Oh.
while telling Maria to actually do the audio check from her dashboard next to the mic symbol. Might help. Okay, somebody else want the mic to talk to us? Augustine. Please go ahead. Augustine. Oh, yes, please. Uh, thank you, Tony. My name is Augustine Kara from Kenya. I've been seated through and have learned a lot. Uh, but I'm coming to fight these uh, engagements after the, the first meeting, very productive and informative, and I have no regrets staying behind. And uh, my observation is that uh, with COVID-19, we find that uh, higher educational institutions in Africa, and specifically even in Kenya where I come from, are making efforts to ensure that they adopt online learning for students and in this mm -hmm. case you find that there are institutions which had systems in place to support online learning and there are also other institutions that largely had nothing mm -hmm. and so we find that in response to the demands of COVID-19 even those who had nothing are doing almost everything possible to ensure that it works what advice would you provide or would you give such institutions which are making everything possible within the context of COVID-19, even when it is evident that they have systematic and inherent limitations? Thank you, Tony. Okay, Augustine, thank you. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I am really impressed with the way that a lot of Kenyan universities have been responding to COVID-19 and the way that they actually spent many, many years growing capacity, infrastructure capacity and also educator capacity across many Kenyan institutions. And the fact that Kenya um, has some of the best infrastructure in Africa, particularly in the urban areas for internet connection, etc. So that I'll start with that. Then if you don't have decent capacity, if you have really shaky infrastructure and your educators are not used to doing things online, the first place is don't pretend. <laughs> and try and think realistically about what it is you want to do and what is possible in the short term and then start planning for medium term and longer term actions. If all you can do in the short, short term is to engage with your students by email, by distribution of physical resources, and by um, something like WhatsApp, then that's where you start. You start with what's possible to you and then you grow from there. Um, there are some institutions that have terrible infrastructure but have an online learning environment and the environment falls down all the time. Don't pretend that you can use that with your students. There are some institutions that have a reliable online learning environment, but the educators have very little preparedness. That really puts the need for professional development um, and workshops and support for educators in the foreground. Um, that's the basic advice I'd give. Okay, thank who's you, next? Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Augustine. Thank you. But if anyone else has particular advice, because you know those kinds of contexts, um, what else would you say to Augustine? Hello. Watsuto, talk to Augustine. Yeah. Yes, I am, I am Sister Euphrasia. I also teach in Kenya. Ah. Yeah, from the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. And this is what I'll have to say. Uh, the issue of COVID-19 got all of us off the curve, that no one was really expecting yeah. that COVID-19 was going to come. And we didn't expect that our institutions were going to shut down just because of COVID-19. You see, in our own scenario, we really needed that knowledge of online teaching and online facilitation. Now, it happened that in my own university, we already had the app of Odell 
online distance learning, which the students had already been introduced to. Now the university had to take some chances where they had to teach their learners, teach the facilitators how to use the online equipment, how to use the, how to post notes, how to interact, how to make discussions, how to answer and respond to each other online. Yeah. Some lecturers went in and adapted Zoom, like in my own classes, I use Zoom where you can be able to interact with your students face to face, they can see you, you can share, you can teach until things are really getting on well. But when you look at things, uh, what I'm really wondering is effective facilitation. How effective is that facilitation at all levels? Because when you come to the Kenyan situation, in the Kenyan context recently, we have had our students going into issues like floods, they are natural calamities. Now, some students come from various backgrounds. Our backgrounds are diverse in such a way that some could not afford bundles to come to class, some could not afford internet. In some of our villages in Kenya, there is no electricity. So where will these students charge their phones if they had? Where will they charge their laptops for them to be able to access online material? And that remains our, our question. Then how do we facilitate and help them? Because now in the Kenyan scenario, most of our universities are talking of having an online exam. How is it going to be effective? How is it going to be of no. great value? Because at the end of the day, when you look at if at all we've taught, but things are really going on well. But when you look at things, really the issue of online teaching is having really a point of thought. That about it so that we can bring all our learners together. Because we include them and teach only those ones who can access online, those ones who can have bundles. Where are we heading to? Yes, there's something about equity and the way that you treat the students in the wrong areas with the lowest incomes and the least access, which actually is really also about the nature yeah. of the community of the university. And, the, and, and there, there are huge ethical issues that, that arise there. Um, and I hear exactly what you're saying about um, people in rural areas without electricity experiencing disasters like floods, et cetera. Um, yeah, and there are no easy solutions to this. Um, that's why we call it emergency remote teaching because it's an emergency and people suddenly with very, almost no warning, suddenly start learning online, suddenly start trying to teach online. And it sometimes turns very messy. And there are a lot of messy compromises that get made in the process. Um, and you want to be able to go beyond that. Maria, I see that your mic is working now, if you want to talk to us. Yes, thank you, Tony. I was just wondering, I don't know, maybe when I was, uh, I was not able to get the connection, maybe you were able to answer these questions which I kept seeing coming up in the chats. People were asking about the cost implication of this course. And I think okay, maybe the cost like, implication. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. And, I, and I'm, 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 I'm having a feeling that maybe this is more about lecturers or universities, uh, because there are some of us who are into, into uh, trainings, which are not really university based. Okay. Uh, there's somebody who's talking here. I'm just muting all the ID. Okay, Maria, in terms of the cost, we have funding from the Carnegie Corporation of New York for facilitating online. With this funding, we will guarantee that if we accept two members from a public university in any African country, those members can get into the course for free. Um, we sometimes take a different approach with regard to private universities and with regard to other sectors. Um, we would then ask if people can pay a fee for participating in the course. The standard fee for participating in that course, if you're outside of public higher education in other sectors, or if you are in other continents, is 7,000 Rand per person which in terms of what courses are being, uh, what courses cost in other areas is not a lot of money, but in terms of your budget, it may be. So um, we are also open to people having conversations with us. It's like, if you want to join the course and there'd normally be a fee that attaches to your participation, 
then let's look and see if there are ways to actually arrange money. So for example, in South Africa, businesses have a skills development yeah, yeah. that they um, pay. That Hola, Yede. Please don't keep your mic on if you with the sound in the background. Thank you. Um, so skills levy. So we have sectoral um, authorities which then can use that skills levy money to pay for training courses and they can reclaim some of that money. There may be similar systems in other countries. I don't know what the situation is like where, where you are, but if you want to take part and you think it will, will be valuable to, to you and very useful and you'll have an impact and you really cannot afford the fee, then talk with us. Okay. Um, and we may be able to come to some resolution which works for you. Um, we don't so want to exclude people. Okay, I'll, I'll be so glad uh, to, to have that conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, I think Olaya, did, did you want to talk, to talk to us as well? Okay. Um, who's taking the mic next? Green it. I can't hear anything. Right? Okay, can we can hear you, Queenith. Okay, I need to hear what what you're saying. You can't hear what I'm saying. Oh gosh. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, because my mic level seems to be okay, I think. Um, how can I register for the course? I'm going to go look for the URL for the course right now. Um, and meanwhile, does somebody else want to take the mic? I'll do that, Tony. Just go on with them. Um, I'll do that. Okay, sure. Yeah, okay. 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 For look at, um, Irene's going to post the URL for the course at the moment. It's just there now. Go there. You'll find um, full information about facilitating online. Um, including links to the OER on which the course is based. Um, and the application process is very early, very easy. We close applications on the 14th of August for the September run of the course. Um, if you apply earlier, we consider you earlier. We consider you um, before we consider people who apply later than you. Okay. Any other interesting questions or insights at this point? Queeneth, can you hear us? No? Okay, um, Irene, can you guide Queeneth to the audio setup? Okay. Thank you. Okay, and there's still a lot of people in the room. You don't have to just listen. You can ask a question. You can share your brilliant insight or your general okay. advice that you would give. Volunteer, SR Women's Day, Auntie Francis, Auntie Kate, Auntie Jane, Dupes Moon, my second moon, Auntie Paulina, Auntie Blue. Sorry, that's interesting. Um, Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, who's next? Helen, talk to us. Hello, Hello Tony. I think this uh, presentation has been quite good. And as much as we say we've started here in Kenya e-learning, we did it in a crisis, emergency, and having listened to this presentation, there is need, there is real need for lecturers to be trained for this online facilitation. One, it's because it was emergency and had a short time to prepare for it. Most lecturers just did their notes, put it on there. There is no psychological connection with the students and all is just to finish probably a semester, hoping that things will work. Uh, COVID will be over by next semester. But unfortunately, we are told we have to adopt to a new normal, which means yeah. we have to do this kind of teaching for a while. And therefore, it's very necessary that all of us are trained 
and really prepare so that we can help our students. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I think we're raising something very important. Under stress, what happens is that people okay. try to do as Please much. Your people, Oladek, at least one. What people try to do is as much of what they are used to doing as from before in a new situation where what you did before isn't necessarily going to work. So there are so many lecturers who want to just reproduce their normal lectures, their face-to-face -face lectures online when their students have the, don't have the bandwidth for this. Um, and we try to do what we're comfortable with in a very unfamiliar and difficult situation. So that creates a problem because the issue is not just about using technology. The issue is also about changing mindset and changing practices. And the worst time to change man's mindset and practices is during a crisis when you feel vulnerable, when you feel um, stressed, that is not a good time to try to change your behavior. Um, so at the moment, I think a lot of people are just surviving. Um, Ada Buknola, is there something okay. you want to say? Am I on, sir? You most definitely are. Talk to us. Okay. You keep saying university, public universities, but I work in a public polytechnic in Nigeria. I... I want to know if I stand a chance. You, know, so. you definitely stand a chance because actually it's like really, it's public higher institutions, higher education okay, institutions. Okay, okay, so okay. please apply. Okay. I have, I applied like a month ago. That's fine. Your, with your application will be considered before applications that are happening now. Um, and we'll be sending out, we'll be sending out responses very soon to oh, your application great. and many others. Oh, great. Thank you. Oh, great. Okay, You're great. Welcome. Thank you so much. Okay. Queeneth, can you talk? Okay, let me try unmuting you. Or is the delayed reaction the unmute? Okay. Who wants the mic next? Are you telling me that this conversation is drawing to a close? Okay. Charity? Will you talk to us? Okay, I just want to say thank you everybody for joining the webinar from right across many, many different regions of Africa. And thank you for your really passionate engagement because this touches on so much of what we're all facing now as educators. Oh, Charity, the family, you're, showing, sharing the, you're telling us about the family, great, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> and um, thank you so much for the conversation afterwards, which really highlights the importance of online facilitation and the difficulty of online teaching, given the context of inequality, the context of access issues that are faced by all African universities from the best resourced universities in Africa to universities that are not as well resourced. Everybody is facing the same issues. Um, and also for highlighting the demand that there is for learning about online facilitation. And we're going to go back to the drawing board and think about a series of short online workshops about online facilitation for people who don't have the time to take part in the course or who urgently need to get moving with online facilitation right now. So, thank you. And um, if anyone wants to just say a few words in closing, we will then be able to move on with the rest of our evenings and lives, depending on your time zone, and hopefully meet again soon. But please take the mic and say what you need to say. 
Yes, uh, Tony, it's been awesome. And uh, honestly, uh, bringing the whole family together. Let me say family now. It's an amazing uh, family. Together. Amazing family. Uh, together is awesome and um, well appreciated for all the resources committed to make this happen. I'm so happy that I'm part of it. And I believe many of us are. So I look forward to another meeting and I hope uh, we will leave and uh, meet again after COVID-19 and be able to, to, to have a lot to share together. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. during COVID-19, we keep meeting together online. Mm -hmm. Good evening. <laughs> Yay, you're here. Talk to us. Okay, so my name is Maria again, and uh, I'm really happy that I was able to hook up uh, on this, um, well, online program. <laughs> yes, it really, because at this time, I have some trainings I'm doing, but I'm just doing them on WhatsApp, free, free online trainings on WhatsApp. And this has, is really encouraging because I'm so hopeful that I'll be able to do something better. I'll be able to set up you know, uh, trainings on Zoom and all of that. Thank you so much for this initiative. Thank you for having us. Thank you for your time, you know, and for answering really, all our questions. I'm really Thank interested you. in, in Thanks, this Maria. course. Thanks, I'm a lecturer and I would really want to um, go through this course all through. But I'm not, I'm not having a good audio. I'm not hearing. I'm Queenet, Dr. Queenet from Nigeria, Ibenedion University of Kaga. Please, can I hear you? Can you help me so I can hear you? Well, we, 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 I think we have tried to help with your audio, uh, but thank you very much for talking to us, Queeneth. Um, and maybe what we can do is actually have some continued conversation with Queeneth offline as well. Uh, let's see if I can find Queeneth's information here. Um, Irene, can you actually just um, send email contact details to Queeneth for further conversation? Thank you. Okay. Anybody else before we leave the room? Uh, I think uh, it's, it's been very good. I, I've enjoyed it. And even if I don't, I, I, I think it's so important that I think that it is worth even paying for this course. It, it, it's, 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 it's really, it's an eye-opener, particularly to me, that I think that we really need, I think I represent a group of lecturers, and I think we need it because it is good, you are doing a good job, and I hope that when we apply, we may be able to be trained. To be trained I'm in not hearing it. anything. I, I can't hear anything. You can't hear, and I can hear you clearly. Okay, so this is a paradox, that you can reply to Queeneth in your voice and Queeneth can't hear what you're saying. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I think there's, there's an issue with audio setup, um, and I've asked um, Irene to be in contact with Queeneth, um, but I think maybe this setup issue can be sorted out before the next, the next event. And I, I think Queeneth's incredibly persistent. Okay, so Helen, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and look, even if we get more applications than we have capacity for, we'll then open a waiting list and then think about how soon we can offer the next one. So Thank please, you. please do apply. Thank you. Okay, one or two more people before we close. close. It feels horrible to close the room on you because I know that, you know, as we start leaving, um, then eventually the room, the room just shuts um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to stay if anyone, if people want to keep talking. Uh, uh, Tony? Yeah? yeah? Can I say something, please? Please, uh, Augustine. Augustine. Yeah, Augustine. Uh, I would certainly wish to appreciate uh, uh, the conveners of today's meeting. And I say, I must say I've learned something about the ethics of online learning community. I've also learned about setting ground rules in online interaction. And lastly, what I've come to observe is that uh, with e-learning, there is room for everyone, unlike commonly held perceptions that e-learning will defranchise some members of the society and promote others. 
in one of your responses, you have indicated that in institutions responding to COVID-19 must look for what will bring every on board and they make progressive steps towards adoption of e-learning. And I think that is the way to go. You have also mentioned that as we craft our platforms, we must consider the kind of gadgets that, are our, that our students are using yeah. in a way that even a student with the lowest quality of gadget will not be left out. And that one I found very promising and also trying to bring on board everybody so that nobody feels left out. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Augustine. The principles are easy, but the implementation of them is actually quite difficult because all our institutions face financial pressures. And the pressure in terms of where, um, where the money is coming from. Yeah. Mutsotso, talk to us. Well, sorry, sorry, let me just come in. Sure. Sorry, this is what I'm saying, that time has come for us to move and adapt new, time has come for us to move and adapt to the new reality that is unfolding before us. It is time yeah. for us now to change from the normal mode of teaching, the face-to-face -face mode of teaching, and then we start now adapting the online kind of teaching where we can still facilitate learning, where we can still keep our learners busy, where we can still keep our learners uh, at par with what is happening when it comes to education so that they are not left behind. But the ideal thing is whatever Augustine has said, that we should try to adapt some means that even those learners with the lowest gadgets, even those learners who have gadgets that cannot go into Zoom, like uh, for example, or maybe other means of teaching can also get the message. It will be too unfair for us as facilitators to only pave way for those ones who can afford and leave maybe those ones whose gadgets are still low standard, those ones whose gadgets cannot really adapt to the new technology to lag behind. So it is a challenge for we as facilitators. What are we doing to help our learners to move at the same pace? What are we doing to help our learners acquire knowledge and skills at the same pace? What are we doing as facilitators to help our learners gain the same knowledge? Because as we are talking, if at all we've been teaching learners who can afford, what about those ones who cannot afford? Yet it was not their making. The COVID-19 issue came in abruptly and that we had to take it as it is and continue learning. So I appreciate the very Sound went for a second, maybe it was sound coming back. On how the online facilitation Thank you. I think that was a very powerful statement. Um, again, a powerful statement, but difficult to make happen well Help in reality. Okay. And move on with their studies. Well okay. Mutsotso, um, thank you very much for that statement. Your sound went. Um, I'm very, gl very glad that you didn't have this issue earlier today, that you're able to say things you wanted to say earlier as well. Um, that statement was powerful, but we all face the, the reality of the politics and economics of our own institutions and the pressures that they face to get students through the year even if it means some students get through and others don't. So this, this is the circumstance that we're facing. Um, and it does not make for easy choices as educators either. Okay, thank you. One more, one or two more, then, we, then we'll go. Okay, thank you for the people that had to leave. Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, and we have we have one uh, person who's been uh, on his feet. He's called Dawit, and his hand is up. Let's see what he has to say. Please. He's been following on his feet. Dawit, please. Talk to us. Okay, Dawit. thank you so much. 
I am from Ethiopia, Dr. Dawit uh, from Haramaya University. Are you hearing me? Your sound is good. Talk to us. Okay, thank you, Tony, uh, for inviting us. I enjoyed to be part of this uh, meeting. There are a lot of insights uh, out of it. As somebody already mentioned, uh, the demand is very high in Ethiopia. Yep. We are uh, trying our level best uh, to make this online teaching a reality. But uh, your training is very, very important. And uh, uh, if there is a way uh, you can facilitate such kind of training at an institutional level, because uh, our scenario and uh, institutional capacity is very different. and. Uh, the concerns that we have uh, are also different. Uh, for us, the staff members of Haramaya University, we need such kind of training very much. I feel that uh, if you have any possibility of organizing such training at an institutional level or country level, no. I feel it is very, very important. That is the kind of comment I have. Thank you so much. Dawid, thank you very much for the comment. I've sent you my email privately. Thank, thank you. Tony, thank you, Tony. Tony thank you. just to come in, this is Margaret again. Hello, Margaret. I, I also wanted to say hello to David, and I tried to coordinate and have sent, sent already an email to, to the ministry, to Moshe, because in Ethiopia, uh, Moshe is coordinating, and I will then contact uh, David, David also privately that we make the Ethiopian approach possible. Thank you very much. Look forward to hearing the next stage of the conversation. Great. Thank you. Okay. There was a sound from somewhere. Okay. Um, Irene, do you think we should be moving towards closing now? What do you think? Yes, please. Uh, and I think um, we need feedback on what they want to see in the future so that we can perhaps organize for that. I've sent the link for the feedback, please. And yes, I think uh, we've been here for quite a bit of time. So we need to close the room. Yes, um, indeed. That's right. While we're here, the afternoon here has turned into evening. And I'm sure that in, um, yeah, in Kenya, the after late, the, the late, very late afternoon has turned into night time. So thank you very much for the time you have spent here. Thank you for your dedication, your passion, your engagement. Looking forward to continuing the conversation, everybody. Stay well and stay safe. And maybe we'll get to meet face to face sometime after this pand pandemic is over. But before that, online, yes. Thank you.